Welcome. This is the first episode of the Struck Podcast. I am your co-host, Dan Blewett, and I am joined here by lightning protection expert, Alan Hall. Alan, how are you? Hey, Dan. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing well. So we are here um, both self-isolating in uh, separate cities. I'm here in Washington, D.C., and you're um, in the uh, on the border of Vermont over on the Massachusetts side. How's, yep. uh, how's everything going up there? It's snowing. It's uh, we're gonna get really? six to eight inches of snow today. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's one of those freak March storms. I guess is today the first day of spring. It's got to be close to it, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah. But we're so far north. Uh, it's it's still winter time until about mid-April. So uh, we're we're sort of self-isolating via snowstorm today. Gotcha. So here on the Struck Podcast, we're gonna talk about everything aviation, uh, lightning protection. Um, Because Alan here is the CEO of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, which is a lightning protection company. And and you've been in this industry for over 20 plus years. Yeah. um, yeah. Lightning protection in uh, both the aviation industry and uh, on wind turbines. So um, you've seen a lot of the evolution of this uh, in the field. Oh, yeah. We've seen a lot of changes in my lifetime. And uh, it's one of those things that we've been doing some research here uh, with our in our company and and kind of going back through some of the history and it's 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 fascinating to see how much has changed in the last 50-ish years from uh, airplanes uh, falling out of the sky big airplanes falling out of the sky to where we are now which it's a pretty rare event which is where the way it should be right I mean we're we should be evolving over time and getting smarter and learning you know what's right and what's wrong and uh, we we've, we've made huge progress but it doesn't mean there's not a lot more to go and there is. Yeah. And, you know, we, we think of all these different modes of transportation and we think of flying being this big, scary thing because we're obviously yep. in this huge, yep. you know, so heavy bird up in the sky, but yet they're incredibly safe. And I think that's owed yeah, to all the true. engineers and the the regulations and, you know, with even just the little things, you know, swapping out a new part um, for a plane, maybe one that wears out, like there's just a lot of uh, steps you have to go to to just make sure the new part that goes in there is as good or better as the previous and yeah. you can't just throw anything on there. There's no cobbling together a, an airplane like you could maybe a used car. Right. Um, and that totally makes different. a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Just sure. because of the safety aspects involved. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a combination of uh, obviously uh, the people who design airplanes getting smarter and having a lot of computational ability helps in that. Um, and then just the process has changed over time where we're much more focused on looking at safety and looking at probabilities of safety and, and delving deep, deep, deep into systems and, and deep, deep, deep into aircraft structure and to test it and make sure that it's going to do what we think it's going to do as we go forward. So there's, there's tons and tons and thousands and thousands and thousands of man hours that go into making an airplane anymore. And in, you know, roughly a, pretty much any airplane program that's going to be several hundred million dollars to billions of dollars to get developed before it first even really gets out in the field. There's a lot of money, a lot of effort to to make those airplanes safe. Thank goodness. Yeah. And so for you as, as a lightning protection expert, um, you know, where does this all start? I know that one of the first recorded uh, lightning strikes on an aircraft was on a, a German Zeppelin back in 1907 or 1915. And the thing just basically just got annihilated right there in front of a lot of people. And they said, wow, I guess, you know, you know, aviation was new at that point. And so they're like, okay, that's a thing that happens. So um, where did it kind of go from there? So we, we sort of evolved over time, especially as the aircrafts evolved over time, right? So the first uh, generation of aircraft were, were just because of power plant issues and not having enough thrust is that the airplanes are made out of wood. Um, and it's a variable material. We knew a lot about it. We were building homes out of wood. We were building a lot of things out of wood, building cars out of wood. So we had an industry that was, that was focused on making things out of wood. And, and even up until, well, all the way through the 1930s, through the Great Depression and into the, into the uh, 19, early 1940s, I mean, most of those airplanes are made out of wood. Or at least really significant portions of them are made out of wood. And then we were learning that uh, aircraft were getting struck. And, and they're getting struck enough where um, you know, aircraft crashes were, were a regular occurrence. So it wasn't surprising when an airplane went down. They think of all the famous people, Will Rogers, Newt Rockney, all the people that had, had died in airplane crashes. 
Um, so it wasn't surprising when there was an airplane crash because they're still in the sort of the infancy of the industry, the, mm -hmm. most, the pilot skills, all those kind of things. But um, over time, as airplanes became metal, we started to realize that, man, you know, maybe their craft are causing the lightning strikes. Maybe they're involved more than we think that they are. And, and maybe we, we should be doing something about it. Um, and that's when the shift started. It was when we realized that maybe we could do something about it. So that all kind of kicked off with uh, not actually a commercial airliner, but the space shuttle, right? That's where they started to really kind of get wind that maybe yeah. these planes were causing the, the, the lightning strikes, which is a really, that's, I don't think that's the way anyone in just the general population thinks about lightning. They kind of think about it as, I was in a field and it started to rain. There was a thunderstorm. I got unlucky yeah. and, it, and it struck me. <laughs> right. Um, but it's the planes actually cause it. Yeah, so the, the the one strike that, and I think it's mostly because of the whole world was focused on it at the time, was the Apollo 12 launch, where the they were headed and just leaving the Cape Canaveral, and they were, I don't know, 15, 30 seconds into flight, and the spacecraft got struck, or well, the rocket got struck, and it got struck again a couple of seconds later, so it got struck twice. Um, a lot of the systems in the spacecraft went haywire. A lot of the guidance stuff in the capsule itself, the rocket, the rocket has its own guidance systems. Thank goodness in the Saturn V's. So the, the Saturn V rocket continued to do what it was going to do because all, all of its instrumentation and things are kind of buried deep down inside of the big metal structure. But the, the, the capsule and, the, and the, the control systems in the capsule and the power distribution systems in the capsule went crazy and shut down. So, you know, it, it, if you're seeing about a big alarm, that's a sort of a worldwide broadcast of, of, of sort of American ingenuity just going haywire there on launch. And it, it started a it started a chain reaction in the United States and, and, and around the world, quite honestly, of, hey, we need to understand what's going on here. Because in the Apollo 12 thing, there wasn't any indication that lightning was going to strike. There hadn't been any lightning strikes in the area and until they launched that, launched that rocket and then it happened. So... You know, it got, well, uh, aircraft could trigger lightning. And then it started a whole chain of engineering evaluations and flight tests and NASA's involved in a bunch. And there's other, other countries involved in figuring out like, hey, uh, lightning is not sort of a random event. Aircraft are actually triggering it. And the bigger they get, the more likely they're going to trigger all these lightning events. And what do they look like? How much energy are in them? Can they affect systems? Obviously, in the Apollo 12 incident, it affected a bunch of systems and you know, the next generation there, you know, once the Apollo got started, they knew they were going to shut them down pretty quickly and start with a space shuttle. So now now we're making this big flying spacecraft thing that looks like an airplane. We're going to have to go land it somewhere. What happens if it gets struck by lightning? So there's a, there's a lot of emphasis by a lot of government agencies to, to go figure out what was going on. And, you know, it, there had been tragedies um, from the 40s and 50s into the 60s in the 1960s. There's a 1963 is a big accident there. Even into the 70s, there are some 70s. There are some big accidents happening on aircraft, and we and we as an industry didn't do all that much about them. It's kind of an assumed thing, like you know, it's a risky business. Um, yeah. And we got out of that sort of test pilot. It's a risky business thing to like. We need this to be safer than it is, and it's not rocket science, so to speak. It's not a rocket science thing. It's just going to take a lot of work and development, and that's that's where the changes really happened. Yeah, well, and what's really interesting is, you know, there were still crashes. I mean, yeah. even last year, there was a, a Russian, um, a Russian jet yeah. got struck by lightning just yeah. after takeoff, and the pilot said he felt a, a, a loss of control. Yeah, circled back, was you know way too heavy with fuel. Probably, yeah. um, they bounced on their landing, and the back half of the plane caught on fire, and half half of the uh, of the the passengers died. The ones yeah. in the back half of the plane, yeah. unfortunately, and yeah. the front half got out. Yeah. But I mean, even now, there's still very isolated incidences, but it still happens, yeah. which is crazy. Yeah. It, it's crazy that it happens. And, and a lot of it, um, not naming specific incidences, but it, but a lot of it is uh, that they didn't think about it, obviously, in any aircraft, air, modern aircraft today. There's been a lot of work done to make sure that a lightning strike doesn't take the airplane down. But the, there's also people in the process the pilots are in the process right so you're relying upon the pilots to make decisions uh, in real time when they're under a lot of stress and and you know the big thing that um, we talk about and sort of in the lightning community i know there's some discussions going on about this now is you know what do you expect the pilot to do when you get hit by lightning and all these lights and buzzers start going off and even though you can fly the airplane the airplane 
can't get back down to earth safely, you know, that that's all great. But what happens and how do they respond to those incidences? I think that's what we're learning a lot about whether um, the lightning protection systems and plans and uh, the way we think things are going to happen, um, we may make assumptions that aren't necessarily right. And I think the, the accident that happened in, in Russia is one of those cases where I think that what I've seen after that is that the pilot said, there's a lot of things going on. You know, I, I lost comms and maybe I lost NAS. I lost some flight control stuff. All this stuff starts happening. And I got to fly the airplane and it's now I'm in a thunderstorm and it's raining and all this stuff's going on. Yeah. How do I respond out of that? Well, you know, it's not easy. And to assume it's you know, like every, every pilot should be able to land. That's not the case, right? When put in pressure situations like that, you don't necessarily know how they're going to respond. And, and in that case, it wasn't a, a, a good ending, right? And from a lightning engineering perspective, we need to think about that. We need to think like, are, are we doing, do we want to light up bells and lights going off in the cockpit? Probably not, you know? And if we had, if, if there had been a, probably a couple of different design changes, it may not have been as many bells and warnings and systems going offline. Uh, yeah. Uh, so obviously, we put a lot of time and effort into making the airplane safe, um, but we also have to sort of get that feedback. We can't be working out of out of a hole all the time and not listening to what's going on in the world around us. And I think that's where where we're starting to get. Um, thank goodness, right? So, airplanes are getting safer. Obviously, we're taking these things and learning from it. And you may see regulation change based on what happened in in Russia. You're going to see regulation changes based on a lot of things that have happened. Um, to make the airplanes more safe and to sort of uh, think about the airplane, not as an engineering project, but as a, as a real safety concern and, and that you treat it that way. And we'll see, you know, I, th- I think my attitude about the aircraft industry has, has been for the longest time. Um, it still has its flight test, test pilot moments. And I'm not sure that we want to be there much longer. Um, you know, we can't all be Chuck Yeager and assume Chuck Yeager's flying the airplane. Can't do that. We need to be, and we can't assume that the pilots have thousands of hours in military service before they get into the get into the seat of a any of any Airbus, Boeing, Embraer, Bombardier airplane, Mitsubishi, whatever. Because um, those days are gone, right? So the 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 pilots coming out of the out of the military, having all kinds of training experience, are gone. A lot of people are doing on their own time and becoming pilots because they love flying. Uh, I'm not sure we've taken that into consideration all the time on the safety aspect. I know we've thought about it. I know the FAA is going through a process right now about that, but everybody's got to do that. It's not just the lightning group. It's got to be everybody putting their two cents in to make the airplane safer. Yeah. So I want to cover the uh, some of the current stuff that's going on with Boeing right now. Obviously, it's not lightning related, but, yeah. you know, industry um you yeah. know, a very big deal for the industry. But yeah. before we do that, um, I'd like to hear just a couple of the, of the standard lightning protection things that a plane is equipped with. So, you know, one, for example, that I thought is really fascinating is that as um, fuel tanks empty, you know, they're pumped with an inert gas, usually I think nitrogen, and that fills the excess space that mm-hmm. used to be taken up by, fu- by fuel. Yep. So that those fuel vapors are harmless, which is crazy because planes used to blow up that way. You know, that's one of the things back in the day. Yeah. I mean, even just, you know, I think 10 years ago, um, yeah. you know, if there was an errant spark, you know, that gap somewhere on the plane, it could yeah. ignite fuel vapors inside these tanks. So that's a really fascinating, um, just, I think, feat of engineering that they're flooding these tanks with inert gas to keep them yep. safe. Um, so what are some of the other ones that, you know, the average passenger is not aware of that's keeping them safe as they fly? Well, I think a lot of it is stuff that you cannot see, right? As you walk up to the airplane, uh, if you ever get the chance to, to actually use air stairs instead of a jetway to go out to an airplane, uh, one of the things you'll you'll notice uh, is if you get close to it, you realize like there's a lot of stuff on this airplane, right? There's a lot of little little features that are on it, and and the lightning protection tends to be one of those little features that you don't necessarily see all the time, so. Like on the 787, on the 787, there's there, it's because it's a carbon fiber airplane, there's a lot of protection things done uh, to protect the carbon fiber structure, which is kind of resistive. It's not aluminum. Uh, there's a lot of work done on the electronic systems and the power distribution systems that keeps those. There's, there's protection devices that actually sit there and 
sense when lightning energy is coming and divert it uh, safely to, to ground and away from the, the way the electronics work. There's a lot of work done in the software even to keep the software from getting upset when the lightning hits the airplane and there's electrical transients bouncing around the airplane. The software, uh, in a lot of cases, just ignores it, right? So it's things you don't see uh, for the most part on an airplane. And the inerting system is one of those things that um, has come about after, you know, so that the TWA 800 event back in the mid 90s uh, outside New York City, where there was just a, you know, there was a vapor space or was an empty fuel tank. And then uh, for whatever reason, there was some sort of spark. We're not sure exactly what that spark was, uh, but it let off an empty fuel tank. And, you know, then there was a big push to, to put inerting systems. And I've worked on some of those inerting systems over time. They're really slick. Um, they take the in, some of the engine air, essentially bleed air, and shove it through a filter and that separates the oxygen molecules from the nitrogen molecules. So it's not pure nitrogen that's going in there. It's just uh, less oxygen <laughs> going into the tank. So you, mm -hmm. you take away, you know, in, in, in order to have a, a, a fire, you need uh a fuel and you need something to come up and it's a spark essentially right so you're 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 taking away that fuel you're making that fuel uh fuel air combination uh, at the wrong mixture so it doesn't want to ignite that's a that's a little trick there but uh you know that technology is not that new it's been around for quite a while but i think it's just the impetus to uh, it, hey we can't we can't uh, assume we've gotten rid of all the sparks or things that can go spark in a fuel tank. And I think that's just it, that we just haven't quite done that yet. And the inerting systems uh, cover when we, we miss things or there's some sort of uh, maintenance miss. And even the regulations that happened after that really changed the way we thought about fuel tanks. Um, we started looking at failure modes and failure modes on failure modes and then failure modes on failure modes and failure modes. So yeah. can you cascade failure modes and get to a place where it is possible to, to have a fuel vapor ignition? Those are big, huge leaps. And from an engineering standpoint, it's a ton of work. It's a ton of work. Um, especially the first time you have to go do it. You don't even, you know, you're starting off with the empty prairie of, of space that you kind of go occupy and figure out like, well, okay, what happens if, and, and it forces everybody to go back and sort of take a deeper look. And I, I think that's okay, right? I think that that's okay that we get forced back into thinking about complex problems and seeing if we can make some improvements. And we have. I think we honestly have. I think the airplanes are going to be are obviously safer than they've ever been, and that's the way it should be. Yeah, so there's obviously be, besides just, a, you know, fuel tank ignition, there's, you know, so there's lightning diverters. There's yep. lots of other little things. What are just, just a quick run through because we'll have – you know, much deeper discussions on on future episodes but what are some of the other just run off the you know off the top of your fingertips um what are some of the other features of lightning protection uh so if you if you work front to back on the airplane uh so on the front of the airplane there is uh, typically some sort of lightning diverter segment of lightning diverter like our product strike tape and then as you get into the cockpit, there's all kinds of, of shielding and wiring protection and things of that sort. On the outside of the airplane, there's uh, a big industry now, which is metal foils on the outside of the airplane, which make the airplane from a plastic airplane into some sort of plastic metal combo. And then as you get into the wings, obviously there's things to prevent lightning sparking into the fuel tank, sealants and paints and coatings and plastics and other things like that. And just all kinds of technology in the fuel tanks today. And then as you get further into the cabin area, all the uh, anything that you're around and is a passenger in there is is connected electrically and grounded, so that you're not exposed to any sort of transient voltages or anything that's going to shock you if the aircraft gets struck. And then as you get toward the back of the airplane, there's a lot of systems in the back of the airplanes typically that um, you don't think about, uh, um, like even like the toilets. I mean, the toilets on an airplane are very complicated systems, quite honestly. The pressurization systems, those kind of things tend to be in the backs of the airplane. There's a tons of technology that go into each one of those to keep those things operating. And, and uh, power plants, same thing on the engines. There's all kinds of all kinds of techniques and, and technology and then those things to to keep everything up and running. And, um, you know, in, it, it's uh, it's evolved a lot as obviously as we've become more of a computerized electronic um society and it, it, even on our personal lives we pretty much have an electronic device of some sort on us all the time maybe a watch a phone uh, airpods you name it uh 
we also have that same sort of thing going on inside the airplane. So uh, we were taking that technology and, and implementing it inside the aircraft for lightning protection. So there's been a, there's a ton, a ton of work. In fact, one of the kind of, when people ask me like, well, how much does it cost to put the lightning protection in an airplane? And how much does it weigh? I mean, the big one is the weight one, right? It's mm-hmm. roughly 1% of the aircraft weight, uh, maybe 3%, somewhere in there. And same thing about cost. If an airplane costs a billion dollars to, to certify, you're probably spending 10 million or so on the lightning protection. Hmm. About 1%. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it makes a big impact. $10 million is still a lot of money. Well, because every commercial airliner is going to get struck once a year on average, right? It's like once yeah. every thousand flight hours. Is that right? Yeah. A typical, uh, typical jet, uh, transport jet is going to fly 2,500 hours ish a year. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's roughly once a year, maybe twice a year. Most of the airplanes are going to get struck. And it, it, it all depends on where you're flying at, obviously, but uh, it's not rare. And a lot of people who fly for work have been in, in aircraft that have been struck probably multiple times, um, depending on how much you fly. So it's, it's a very, very common thing to happen. Gotcha. So let's speak a little bit about uh, the Boeing situation that's going on right now. Obviously, the 737 Max had tons yep. of problems. Yeah. Um, so as you know, an industry insider, um, you know, what's what's your take on on that whole situation? So obviously, it's a tragic situation. Uh, there's no way of looking at that problem where you don't think, man, there's just been all kinds of, of, of things that have just cascaded into a problem and, and then led to, you know, the loss of life, which is just you know, something that the industry um, and everybody grieves, grieves about. I, I think the thing that we're, we're seeing, and we're, obviously we don't have firsthand knowledge, right? I think that's one of the things that when these things, events happen, you, you get a lot of um, Monday morning quarterbacking that happens, yeah. but having been on the inside and, and watched a lot of different aircraft companies develop their airplanes and particularly the safety groups and how they have worked in the last 10 years or so they're really really spending uber amounts of time trying to get the safety aspects right and looking at probabilities of components failures and looking at um, uh, obvious um, failure modes that can exist and how those can cascade into other problems and I, i i have a hard time when i see some of the some of the uh, newspaper articles or typically you know, things you read from Seattle tend to be, you know, obviously kind of quasi pro Boeing. Maybe you can say it that way, but um, I, I think you get a little more inside baseball from, from news up in Seattle, but it isn't like people are sleeping on the job. I, I don't think that happened. I, I think that everybody was trying to do their best to make this system safe. And you can criticize them after the fact about, did they have enough sensors going in to, to make the system work properly? Obviously, if they had to do it over again, they'd have more sensors connected to the system, so it would have less chance of, of reacting. But I think there's also sort of that uh, pilot interaction problem, which they assumed that if there was a problem with the system, that the pilot to respond in, in this particular case, it's a horizontal stabilizer trim. Horizontal stabilizer trim makes the airplane go up and down and makes it fly so, so that you don't have a lot of control forces on the control stick. So you can move the horizontal stabilizer up and down. It's similar to the elevator, which is just behind it. So it makes the nose go up and down. And so if you can move the horizontal stabilizer up and down, uh, it just makes the airplane fly a little bit smoother. And it's from automated systems, the automated systems tend to control the horizontal stabilizer, not the elevator. So when... Uh, the MCAS system in this particular case decides that it's getting sensor input saying it's got to push the nose down. It starts driving the horizontal stabilizer to, to drive the nose down. That's no different than a lot of other failure modes that can happen. They can cause the same thing. Now, how they originate doesn't really matter at that point. If you have a horizontal stabilizer doing something that you don't like, the way that the 737 appears to be set up is there's a switch to turn it off. And in some cases, it seems like some pilots knew that and turned off the horizontal stabilizer so it, it couldn't do that. And so at that point, you're sort of flying the airplane by hand a little bit. Or if you kicked on the autopilot, I think the autopilot would ignore the MCAS system and continue to fly the airplane. It just happened to be you got a pilot that reacted differently, that, they, that Boeing hadn't thought that they would react differently. 
And I think that's where the disconnect is, is that the, the, the safety people have done an analysis and looked at the probabilities of the chances it happened would be extremely remote. Um, they ran into a situation where they had a lot of sensors that had gone bad and pilots didn't know how to necessarily react to the way the airplane was handling. Mm. That leads up to, to, from a safety standpoint, to sort of an unknown out, outcome. And, and then that's where the problem lies, is that um, you've got so many people from s- different parts of the world flying airplanes, and you've, you've got design groups that are thinking one thing, and pilots maybe thinking another. And, and that's where you're going to see a lot of the training things pop in. And that's, that's where EASA and the FAA and the Transport Canada and a lot of the, a lot of the certifying organizations are starting to say, hey, maybe we need to go back and take a look at pilot training and, and get the pilots a little more up to date on some of this stuff. And that's, that's probably a good move, whether they needed it or not at the beginning. You know, I, I think if you'd asked anybody in the industry, they would say probably no. I mean, if a horizontal stabilizer starts to misbehave, turn it off. There's a switch right by, right in the center console to turn the thing off. Yeah. And, and there's indicators down there that tell you it's moving. So it isn't like you don't know what's happening. You can clearly see what's happening. It's just how you respond to it. And I think that's where we in the, in, in sort of the lightning area need to take that into consideration because we also deal with um, systems and electronics that can misbehave. And if they do misbehave, we have to go look at what those consequences are. And a lot of, in, in some instances, we assume that the pilot always makes the right move, that the, that, the, that the pilot knows exactly what to go do every single time. And I don't think, and I think this 737 thing kind of proves it out, the pilots always know exactly what to do. So having less chaos in the cockpit is always a good thing, obviously. Mm-hmm. Right. So we are trying to push ourselves into less chaos and things that we're doing in my opinion, things we do on the lightning side should lead to less chaos. The airplane should still be flyable. It should be simple to get it into a flyable mode. We shouldn't have a lot of bells and warnings. And I think that's one of the things that's changing. I heard the other day where they're talking about the number of uh, audio tones that are happening or interfering with the pilot's thought process. Yeah. If you're ever in a, in a, in a, in a cockpit and you get anywhere near stall on some of these airplanes, uh, the stick starts shaking and sometimes there's a stick pusher. The, p- the actual stick moves forward. There's all kinds of buzzers and sounds and things going off. It's a lot. And if you haven't trained for that or been through it once, it seems like there's just too much to process in your brain simultaneously. So it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. But if you're sitting at your desk and you're, you know, you got your, your cup of coffee and you're designing a, a lightning protection system for this electronic system, flight control system, um, you want the light to come on when it's not telling you the right thing. That's cool. But uh, what other lights are going to come on simultaneously? And how do we handle that? That, that I think that's, that's the, the big question right now is like combinational errors, like that crash in Russia. Yeah. It's all leading back to that same sort of thing. Yeah. It's funny in the, uh, in, in the baseball world, cause I have, you know, I have a background in baseball. Yep. They turn, they turn that sped up and that happens yep. when, you know, yep. you see a guy debut in the big leagues. And he's played that game his whole life, but now there's more fans, <laughs> there's bright lights, there's, yeah. it's a very different environment. And suddenly your mind is racing yeah. and you can't focus on any one thing very well. And you can't do the thing that you've been doing your whole life very yeah. well. So it's not yeah. like that same thing in a cockpit. Yeah. You have to suddenly yeah. make all these decisions and all these yeah. different pieces of stimuli and feedback are suddenly, you know, beeping at you, flashing at you. And yeah. now you go, this was an unknown. Why is the plane doing this? Yeah, that seems like a lot of really important decisions to have to make in a short period mm-hmm. of time. Yeah, and it's called uh, we call it flying by the seat of your pants, and that's in the sort of the pilot lingo of what happens. You get definitely sped up, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, if if you do not have that sense of experience, you, you start to fly by the seat of your pants, which is exactly the wrong thing to do. You start to feel things like how does the airplane feel? I I can feel it accelerating, I can feel it decelerating, I can feel it going up, I can feel it go down. All those all those sensors are baloney. All right. Your brain, yeah. your brain is telling you wrong stuff. And it's it's it comes down to, to, to be able to sort through that and figure out the things that you need to focus on and dump on all the rest. That's a skill. And in 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 sports and in piloting and driving a car and something and some of these Tesla accidents that have happened, it's a skill. It's a skill set and you need to develop it. And it, it takes time to do it. And, and I think you're going to see a lot more in terms of training to, to do that. 
thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, it rem- reminds me of the uh, the scene in Airplane, <laughs> you know, that classic movie <laughs> where, I mean, there's yeah. so many things you could reference at this moment, but yeah. um, I just love when Leslie Nielsen, you know, opens the door and says, just want to remind you, we're all counting on you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> needed that. Yeah. Thanks for the old yeah. shot of pressure added yeah. to all this. Yeah, that, yeah. that movie just is just a that. gem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like that, right? I mean, um, if if you're in any sort of new situation or in a, in a new sort of environment, your brain isn't necessarily the right tool to get through it, especially especially relying on your on some of your senses to tell you the truth. This may not be the right thing on an airplane, and that, that and that's yeah. one of the early skills. Yeah. Well, and that's why I think one of the, the, you know, people, it's a really hot button issue where people are thinking about the future of self-driving cars. And, yep. you know, my buddy who's very and much on the, te- on the on the Tesla bandwagon, he's like, yep. yeah, I'm going to be one of the first ones to get a self-driving car. And, and initially I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to put, yeah. I think a lot of people are like, I don't want to put my life in the hands of a, of a machine. But then when you really start yeah. to think about it and how fast they can make very complex decisions yeah. compared to someone who's easily distracted, who gets emotional, who's, yeah. you know, humans have a lot of other, you know, things that um, get in the way of good decision. And then you think, Oh yeah, right. you know what, if this, if this machine driving a car or an airplane has double, triple redundancy, it can process all of these complex things way faster than I can. Yeah. I'm probably safer putting my hands in it rather than my own decisions. Yeah. I think there's, there's two, uh, schools of thought on that right now. Uh, and I think you see it in, in two different companies. I think uh, Boeing has, has historically relied on pilots and, and pilot training to, to do things. Airbus has tended to take automation as the, the way to do it. And I'm not sure there's any particularly right answer there. I know Steve Wozniak with uh, Apple talks about, um, there's no robot that can make me a cup of coffee. I can walk into my house and make me a cup of coffee. Yeah. That's right. It's a very, some of the most simplistic things in the world that we do all the time as humans are very difficult to automate. And I, I kind of wonder if we're going to be in that similar situation with some of these newer aircraft designs um, as we go through, because it, it, there is a human element to it. There's a, there's a lot of functionality in a human being, which is not necessarily in a computer. So I kind of wonder how that's all going to work out, but we're going to find out. I think that's the thing. Over the next couple of years, we're going to find out because the, the, the Teslas of the world are not going away and all the automated things are not going away. So it's going to be interesting to kind of watch this go down. Yeah. And we'll get into a lot of those topics uh, here on the show. So yeah, Alan, uh, appreciate you. Great first episode. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. We are through episode number one. So for you out there listening, thank you for listening. Um, be sure to subscribe here. Uh, this will be available everywhere you listen to podcasts. So your iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever. Um, definitely subscribe, share us with a friend, and uh, also be sure to check out on YouTube. So if you're into you know watching us, there's a video version, and you can check us out on YouTube as well. So thanks again for uh, for tuning in, and we'll catch you here on the next episode of the Struck Podcast. Mm-hmm.